Good evening. My name is Wilson Lamb, and I'm here with Claire Bocchini tonight, and we're going to talk about the Texas Ledge, the 87th session. It's already kind of midway through its session. It started back in January, and it goes for about 140 days. Now, uh, this evening, we'd really like to recall the political landscape of what happened in 2020 as it sets up the Texas legislature. We're going to review how to engage Texas Ledge offices, and this is a crazy year because of COVID, so the Texas Ledge is... Uh, Someone in per it's a hybrid, someone in person, but someone also still virtual. And then we'll have an open discussion about the healthcare related initiatives for the uh, Texas Ledge 2021. Before we get started here, how many of you guys are new to uh, legislative advocacy? I'm just gonna peek in on the chat box to see if anybody, uh, actually how many people have actually done this before out of the group that we have here? Let's see there are 18 people logged on. If you just wanna talk, hit a, a Y or a me or something like that, we can get a, a better feel for what percentage of people are out there. Okay. Awesome. So about a quarter, maybe 20 to 30%, never in Texas. Okay, great. Well, uh, Texas is a little bit different than, than some of the other places. But I think this gets a good feel of of roughly about a third. So that means over half our folks haven't had the opportunity to, to do legislative advocacy. It starts by knowing who represents you. So if everyone just wanted to log in on a different screen to and just type into a Google search bar, who represents me? And it should pull up this screen here. You can type in your street address and it'll pull up, pull up a list of who represents you in, across the state. And you don't have to tell me, but for those of you who live in the Houston area, greater Houston area, uh, and especially the medical center, I'm going to highlight some of the representatives and senators who we're going to be talking about this evening. So the Texas governor and lieutenant governor are uh, at large, so they represent the entire state. You're going to have a state senator and a state representative that are different from your U.S. congressional representative and your U.S. senator who are uh, also at large, the U.S. senators are at large. So really the big four I've bolded up here are going to be the ones uh, to be aware of that we'll be discussing a little bit about how they influence the Texas ledge. So you guys should be populating on your, your screens now. You probably came up with a variety of lists. And from 2019 to 2021, a lot of people say that, you know, incumbents end up holding offices and it's very difficult to unseat an incumbent unless there are paradigm shifts or uh, major changes that are happening. So if you look at the state representative, for those who live close to the medical center, you probably had somebody like this in 2019 on the left side column, Sarah Davis, Garnett Coleman, Sean Theory, Jessica Farrar, Christina Morales. And uh, two of those seats have turned over. Uh, Ann Johnson defeated Sarah Davis in the recent election and Jessica Farrar retired her seat, and uh, Representative Shaw now uh, represents that part of uh, the Med Center. And then uh, state senators, there were no changes. Boris Miles, Joan Huffman, John Whitmire, and Carol Alvarado represent the bulk of the Texas Medical Center. And the five U.S. representatives, Dan Crenshaw, Lizzie Fletcher, Al Green, Sheila Jackson Lee, and Sylvia Garcia are exactly the same. So those uh, did not change either in the last election cycle. And these are the parts of the city that they represent. So in 2019, so kind of the uh, West University and just north of that into the uh, Heights area ended up uh, 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 switching their representatives. The senators remain the same uh, with uh, Carol Alvarado taking over Sylvia Garcia's seat as she uh, took the promotion to U.S. representative and these this area of Houston. Uh, Culberson was uh, defeated by Fletcher and uh, Garcia has taken over the Gene Green seat. Okay, so when you're thinking about how big is the Texas legislature, I've always tried to find it actually written down the reasoning why, but there are 31 senators in the Texas Senate and there are 150 representatives in the Texas House of Representatives. And uh, the only place I could find it online came off this yellow rose of Texas uh, Republican uh, women's uh, page. There are 31 Proverbs in the Bible, and there are 150 Psalms in the Bible, so it seems that uh, those numbers uh, had their uh, biblical references back then. Okay, so the Texas governor, as you guys know, is Greg Abbott, and 
you've seen a lot of him lately. Uh, if, uh, if you had any uh, effect of the winter storms, you probably saw him around there. If you've seen or heard about something called COVID, you've probably heard about his uh, 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 state mandates or state uh, lack of state mandate uh, for things such as masking. And uh, he again won in his last election. If you look at uh, uh, since 2002, and actually uh, th these first years up into 2010 were the Rick Perry years, but from 2010 through uh, 2018, uh, he's had a, a lot of popularity, declining 64%, 59%, 55%, but uh, still a commanding lead in Texas. And these were the initiatives which you can find on his website. He's basically broken it down into four categories, looking at health, including uh, COVID vaccinations, looking at pre-existing conditions, telehealth, telemedicine, and mental health, particularly building off previous sessions. Um, he's looking at keeping Texas safer, is what he says. Uh, he's against uh, defunding the police, uh, reforming uh, the bail system, law uh, putting out more law enforcement tools and training, and trying to secure the border. Uh, and then uh, working on uh, freedom, particularly preventing religious shutdowns and uh, maintaining election integrity, protecting the Second Amendment rights, and then being anti-abortion. And then he wants to keep Texas prosperous by balancing the budget, uh, using uh, uh, establishing a statewide broadband program, particularly to rural areas, working on uh, maintaining jobs, civil liability protections, and trying to uh, reduce regulation in this era. So these end up being at least the initiatives according to his website. And I will say that, again, DFC is a 501c3 nonprofit, so my job is really to, to report kind of uh, these initiatives that are, that are out there. <laughs> uh, uh, the lieutenant governor, as you guys are familiar with, is Dan Patrick. And he's in charge of what the Texas Senate does. And so if you think about it, there's 150 representatives and there are only 31 senators. So roughly five representatives per senator. And that carries a lot more weight. Uh, and so uh, the governor really has a little bit more ability to kind of dictate, uh, sorry, the lieutenant governor has a little bit more ability to dictate what the Texas legislature uh, can do. And he put out 31 priorities on his uh, website as well. I'm sure this is in relation to the number of senators that are out there, which as you guys know, was refers back to uh, uh, the Proverbs. Um, and he divided into a safe and secure Texas future, very parallel to uh, what Governor Abbott's are, life, liberty, and conservative values. Again, very similar to uh, Governor Abbott. And then protecting taxpayers and the Texas economy, again, parallel to uh, uh, Governor Abbott. So it seems like the two of them are, are seeing eye to eye in terms of their executive and legislative agendas. And in previous years, uh, you can see that his uh, uh, rating has come on down to roughly just about 51% uh, is what he took in 2018 to, to win re-election. All righty, the state senators and representatives. So those who uh, live in the uh, West U or uh, Bel Air side of the medical center uh, probably noticed that House District 134 flipped from uh, Republican to Democrat. So uh, Sarah Davis, who served from 2011 through 2021, has uh, uh, exited office and Ann Johnson has taken that seat. Uh, Boris Miles, who was a representative uh, to the South, I think it's 145, uh, ended up uh, uh, being uh, the, I think it's the 13th uh, Senate district. And so these are people that are, uh, you can talk to, their their doors are, are always open. And these are the areas of town that they represent. So here is uh, the Westview, Bel Air, uh, part of the medical center. Garnett Coleman represents the more easterly uh, side of the medical center. And he again is sitting on uh, the public health committee. He oftentimes shares about his uh, uh, pub, uh, ailments uh, in, that are related to the medical industry. He talks about uh, diabetes and mental health conditions. So uh, he has sat on there for a long time and is really one of the guys who's helped guide uh, the public health committee since the 1990s. And the southern area of the medical center is represented by uh, Sean Theory. And when she was a freshman uh, representative uh, two sessions ago, she ended up uh, uh, being really involved in maternal health and uh, the high rate of uh, maternal morbidity and mortality that's going on. Okay, so probably the most uh, eventful uh, politics uh, over the break is the Speaker of the House. And this picture is of 
uh, Representative Dade Phelan or Speaker uh, Dade Phelan. He is the third Speaker of the House in three consecutive sessions. So two sessions ago, it was uh, uh, Joe, Joe Strauss from uh, the San Antonio area, a very moderate, middle of the road kind of guy. Uh, last session, it was Dennis Bonin from the uh, uh, from the Angleton uh, type area. And uh, over the summer, you guys may have heard about a uh, controversial tape recording by one of the more conservative groups uh, targeting uh, several of the representatives. And uh, because of that uh, fiasco, uh, uh, Speaker Bonin opted not to uh, renew or uh, uh, continue his uh, application for the uh, for the Texas legislature. So he retired his seat. Um, he is the first from the southeast Texas, kind of the Beaumont area. And he was actually elected in by his colleagues 143 to 2. So out of 149 representatives who aren't him, 143 uh, were in favor of him. Two were against. Two of these are actually freshmen, uh, Brian Sladen and Representative Kaysen, who replaced uh, uh, Representative Stickland from, from Bedford, were actually against him because they felt that he was not conservative enough. They really wanted to, uh, they did not like that he was working on both sides of the aisle. Four people were absent. I wasn't able to check who they were, but two of them were because of COVID precautions. Uh, in terms of committee chairs, which we're going to cover in a second, he really wanted to specify that he was into new faces. Uh, there were significant demotions. Uh, Dan Huberty, who's uh, in charge of education, who really helped to align uh, uh, the teachers and the budgets in the last session. For Price, who's been a former head of the uh, Public Health Committee. Charlie Jaron, who's one of the uh, ger generals of the Joe Strauss era. And the people who they called the X-Men, the 10 uh, uh, Republican representatives who were kind of targeted in the, um, the, uh, the Dennis Bonin uh, tape recording, all of them ended up kind of uh, uh, either being demoted or losing their chairs or not being given special roles. And the people who were awarded their special roles could be all listed here on a tweet that uh, um, uh, represent Speaker Phelan had sent out, uh, uh, putting himself first. And there were uh, 74, uh, sorry, 83 representatives who already on uh, initial said that they would support him. And so to the victor go the spoils. Uh, it's a lot like uh, high school or middle school that uh, if, if you buddy-buddy uh, with somebody from early on, you'll find that you get to, to sit in a lot of positions of power. So it's no surprise that if you were there from the beginning, you were awarded chairs and vice chairs. And if you didn't, even if you had served many uh, sessions in a row and done wonderful things, you might find yourself uh, as a spectator or uh, maybe just sitting on committee this session. Okay, so this is what the new house looks like. There are uh, 16 freshmen, and so 16 new people who were elected in. And if you think that's a lot, it's actually less than the 26 that were elected in 2019. It's the exact same demographics. There are 83 Republicans and 67 Democrats. And the reason why is, as you look at uh, who beat who, whenever it says defeated so-and-so, it was defeated usually in the primary. So all of these are defeated in the primary where uh, you got a, a different representative. So the new person, Slayton, defeated a guy named Flynn, who was actually involved with uh, Representative Bonin or uh, during that uh, um, tape recording. Uh, otherwise, it was because people retired and people took their seats. Um, uh, Representative Miller withdrew after there were uh, some comments that he had made in the election season, and it was asked by uh, Governor Abbott to step aside. Uh, one of our dear friends, uh, Dr. Zerwas retired and uh, took a promotion to the uh, um, uh, the Texas uh, administration, uh, the UT system, in 2020. Another one of our friends, uh, Dr. Uh, J.D. Sheffield, was defeated in his primary by uh, Representative Slauson. Uh, and then uh, on the other side, when you had people who graduated up to the Senate, you also had people come in and take their seats as well as, as new representatives. The only two uh, districts that flipped were House District 132, where Mike Schofield uh, defeated the incumbent, uh, Gina Kal Kalani, and uh, he had actually been the uh, representative for like three or four sessions before. And then Ann Johnson, in her rematch with Sarah Davis, defeated uh, Sarah Davis in this past session. But all the others were either retirements or um, a move more towards the, uh, uh, less to the middle, more towards the sides, the sidedness of the politics uh, in the primaries. In the Senate, one seat returned uh, to the Democrat uh, uh, 
uh, possession. Uh, in 2021, it was uh, Senator Gutierrez, who was a former representative. He defeated Pete Flores. Uh, that was actually a seat that in special elections, the Republicans did not anticipate getting. I think in over 70 years, it had been under Democrat control. So it was a surprise when they were able to increase from 18 to 19. And then uh, the Democrats took the uh, expected seat back. These other two uh, new senators uh, actually maintained party Blanco when Rodriguez retired, and then Springer uh, took over when um, uh, Fallon went up into the U.S. House of Representatives. There's st still five. So last session, there were seven positions. We uh, lost uh, uh, Rep Representative Zerwas and uh, Rep Representative Sheffield, as we talked about, but there are two in the House, a neurosurgeon, Greg Bonin, who's the brother of uh, Dennis Bonin. He's a neurosurgeon and in charge now of appropriations. And then Tom Oliverson is an anesthesiologist who is part of Dr. Zerwas's practice, and he's gonna be the chair of insurance. In the Senate, the three senators who have uh, maintained their seats uh, uh, Don Buckingham, a plastic surgeon, was reelected in. Donna Campbell, who is an ophthalmologist ER in, uh, in a rural county, is, uh, is still there with uh, Charles Schwartner, an orthopod, <laughs> formerly in charge of health and human services. So these are the important committees that are out there. And I tried to put the, uh, the chairs who are all involved. So in public health, uh, Stephanie Click is a nurse who's in charge of public health. Um, she is really pushing forward on a scope of practice type bill, and so that's probably something that will be uh, heard of a bunch during uh, this, this session. Uh, from Houston, Tom Oliverson and Garnett Coleman also sit on public health, among others. Uh, Dr. Oliverson is also in charge of the insurance committee. Carol Dutton, who's a Democrat, uh, is uh, in charge of the edu public education committee. Uh, he's been with the Republicans in favor of uh, advancing charter schools. And so uh, this is a committee that has a Democrat both as the chair and the vice chair. Uh, calendars went to uh, Representative Burrow, Dustin Burroughs, uh, the state committee with uh, Chris Patty, and Appropriations Article 2 is the one that's in charge of the funding for uh, health, public health related things. And it's uh, Representative Capriglioni or pa Capriglioni. Cap Capriglioni is a cap, cap, he doesn't say it Italian. but although he says it very Texan, Caprigli, Capriglioni and uh, Caprilione yeah. and uh, uh, Ann Johnson, who's the representative for House District 134, will actually take over Sarah Davis's seat on that Appropriations Article 2 committee as well. In the Senate, the big two committees that really align with uh, our uh, advocacy include the Health and Human Services, where Lois Colcourse will serve as uh, chair again. Uh, Boris Miles, who uh, represents the medical center, also sits on HHS. And then it, Larry Taylor, who's been in, uh, the chair of, of education, will again take on that role for this session. So what else can you do to get involved in legislative advocacy? So writing your legislator, calling your legislator, emailing your legislator, everything counts. Meeting them in person, whether it's in Austin and then uh, either having your COVID vaccine card or um, uh, or uh, or doing it online through uh, uh, the virtual meetings, staying up to date on issues by uh, good sources such as Twitter or the Texas Tribune, and then educating others either through social media, perhaps writing an op-ed, or uh, educating the greater community. Really, what moves uh, decisions at the the state legislature level are stories, and so collecting patient stories in case you would like to give testimony really helps to, to move the agenda as well. But there are really many more options that are out there. What I always like to tell first timers going to the Capitol is that there's a certain currency of legislative advocacy. And it just seems that the silent majority is losing out to a very vocal minority because the, that very vocal minority is getting in touch. They're going to Austin. They're strafing the offices. They're meeting with people. They're donating uh, funds to uh, several offices and to campaigns. So if I had to just make up currency in my mind, an email is a penny for your thoughts. It's, it's the least, but it, it's something, but it's very the least amount of what you can do to move uh, uh, the... Oh but it, it counts, it, it still counts. A letter, a particular if you sign something or if you rent something, that might be a nickel, and a phone call may be worth a dime. So we're really starting to increase more the more you uh, make that connection. If you go to Austin and visit them during the session, now maybe that's a quarter, uh, and you keep doing that over and over again, but if you meet them in their interim session, uh, then uh, especially at their district office, that might start to be a, a, a dollar's worth. And as you start to do that more often, you're really trying to build continuity because continuity is really what helps to move things. It's like erosion. Uh, how do you build the Grand Canyon? It's not by one big uh, uh, push. It's over time and a lot of 
of efforts and really building those relationships. So your ideas can absolutely make a good bill for the Texas legislature, uh, particularly uh, sharpened by stories and, and things that you face. How does a bill become a law? This goes back to uh, Schoolhouse Rocks, uh, just a bill on Capitol Hill, and this includes the Capitol here in Texas. The House of Representatives has a side and the Senate has a side, and people are assigned to committees. And first, somebody has to draft a bill and submit it. Once that bill is, is written, it then goes to committee. And as it goes to committee, they will then, uh, it gets assigned to a committee. And then the committee uh, will review it and decide on which ones get heard. And if it gets heard, it can either be voted unanimously out or it can be voted out with uh, a majority. And after it's voted out, it has to go through the calendars committee. And that's why the calendars committee is so important. Uh, on the Senate side, it's called the intent calendar. And what that means is you may have something that's really good, but it wasn't a 100% agreement to get out there, and the uh, calendars committee could poo-poo on it and just sit on it so that it really doesn't come up to term. Because if it's not decided in that first 140 days, it really isn't going to make it. And so oftentimes bills are heard through two or three or four different sessions, gaining momentum before it can become a law because it just needs time to, to, to make its way. Once the calendars is posted, it goes on to floor debate. After floor debate, uh, it may be uh, edited so that both sides of the House and the Senate have very similar looking bills. And once both sides approve, sim approve similar looking bills, it shows up on the governor's desk where it can either be signed into law or it can be vetoed. And then if it's vetoed, then it still would require things like a supermajority um, in order to, uh, to overturn a veto. But that's essentially uh, uh, what's required in each session. So we're playing over uh, several sessions don't expect everything to happen all in one go. So it's a 19 week, 140 day session. And this is what the demographics have looked like since 2009 to 2021. So what used to be a 50-50 house back in 2009 took kind of a two thirds, one third in 2011, and slowly it's worked its way back to kind of 55, 45%. And then over here, uh, it's really stayed roughly the same. This is the closest the, the Democrats have been at kind of 18, 13. There are some of the uh, Republicans who tend to be more moderate and may, may swing to 17, 14. But uh, in general, it, it still is what they call a, a trifecta, where the executive branch and both House and Senate uh, belong under uh, Republican control. OK. so. Maybe you're thinking about bills. Maybe you have an idea about uh, a legislature in, in healthcare, or maybe it's about uh, um, uh, firearm safety. And if you wanted to look up information, you could just search legislation on the, and this is 84th, but it's the same page as the 87th legislature uh, regular session. And you can just type a, a search on the word or phrase, and it'll pull up all the appropriate legislation that's involved with it. Um, if you know specifically the bill or the author, you can also type that in there and it'll uh, show up as well. But really keeping up to date with Texas Tribune and joining Twitter can be ways to uh, keep up to date on, on uh, what's going on. Uh, one of the uh, lobbying strategists uh, with Frontera said, if you're not on Twitter, you don't know what's happening in the Texas legislature. If I honestly have to say, it's not about uh, uh, Facebook or finding friends and looking at uh, you know past people from 20, 30, 40 years ago. What it really is about is staying up to date with, with the newest education. So here's a list of, of various folks who are out there um, uh, from the governor to uh, U.S. representatives, U.S. senators, and I encourage you, if you haven't formed one, go ahead and uh, create an account, and then you can be a lurker and explore the hashtag Texas Ledge and see what's trending. Uh, make it a goal to follow at least 10 new accounts uh, today or when you form your account, because you never know what different sources will have that can help guide you. Okay, it matters, and this is an old study that I quote from uh, about five years ago that over 43% of adults get their health information through social media like Facebook and Twitter. So uh, be careful. And then 90% of the younger generation, 18 to 24, so college age kids or people just out of high school, say they trust medical information shared by others on social media. So better that we as the healthcare providers and those who are uh, uh, advocating on behalf of healthcare should get out there as well to at least uh, put down some of the misinformation and try to promote true information. Many media outlets have health blogs which readers can comment on, and 60% of consumers say they trust health information on social media uh, uh, that comes from uh, providers. 
everybody's essentially on Congress. This is an, uh, an old slide now from, from 2009, so 11 years ago, where there were still some people delegations that were only greater than 70%. I would imagine that over that 100% of people are now on Twitter and likely Facebook as well. A lot of people use that for, for their campaigns and contributions. Uh, the Texas Tribune is a nonpartisan source, so they're also 501c3, and this is a great way. This came off uh, literally the page from yesterday as I was reading through it, uh, talking about uh, Ge Governor Greg Abbott and uh, rejecting aid from uh, the Biden administration over coronavirus and uh, testing for migrants, um, debates uh, ramps up over emergency powers during the pandemic. So these are the types of things that are, are uh, kind of polling out there right now and things that, for people to be um, aware of. And when you're starting to talk about offices, you really need to know who your audience is. And it really helps to ha have homework. And the good thing is that we love doing that homework for you to figure out the decision maker, uh, the background of that decision maker. What committees do they sit on? Why are you meeting with them? Is this their first session or have they been in this for five years? Were they a, a former chair and they got demoted in this uh, in the 2020 politic or not? Has Do we have a relationship with the office? Um, where are they in the uh, election re-election cycle if they're a senator? Every, the representatives is every two years, but the Senate is every four, uh, uh, four to two uh, years. Um, do they have leadership roles? What are their concerns and motivations? Uh, what are their victories and losses? You don't want to uh, rub in things where uh, they've gone before uh, and, and uh, unfortunately were uh, chastised by their party. So uh, it's really important to use this relationship, building a strategic discussions. That's how we end up getting people on our side. Um, important to understand what motivates them. If they're elected, it's really what are their constituents thinking? Who are their voters? If you are their constituent, you have to say that. If your parents or your family members are in that district, share that as well, because you, they really want to have that connection and know that uh, in talking to you, they're garnering votes for the next session. That's what their office is, is working on as well. Regulatory agencies, they're bound by their own set of guidelines and their employers and community leaders. It's the court of public opinion, but it's much less a direct w way than an elected official where the votes matter. So things, when we communicate them with them, we really want to do attention grabbers. When we send them things, there'll be a bright colored paper, for example, it draws attention, complimenting what they've done uh, well in, in past sessions. Hey, we really like that anti-human trafficking work that you've done. That was work on the palliative care uh, um, uh, legislation. Uh, make effort to know who their aides are because oftentimes they'll follow them uh, through sessions. There are oftentimes chiefs of staff that have been with uh, their legislator for three, five, ten sessions uh, out there. Uh, inviting them to events. So we have our uh, DFC uh, healthcare heroes that we've awarded as well um, and given them at, at our annual meetings, sending them congratulations, especially you could do that on social media, send them a tweet and then demonstrating trustworthy enough to make sure that when we they ask for information, we get them information that's uh, crucial and accurate, um, uh, particularly like policy briefs. But you never want to challenge them. You don't want to say, you promised, you told us you were going to do this. Don't overstep time limits and don't threaten them as well. Uh, this is an example of uh, one of the Houston reps, uh, Gene Wu, who our office has collaborated with uh, very nicely. And I think this is from several sessions ago when um, I looked a lot younger. And then this is uh, one of uh, Representative uh, Dr. John Zerwas, who was uh, one of our, our um, healthcare heroes as well. Uh, okay. uh, when can you get involved? Every step of the way. So uh, if you look at this, this is, uh, hey, someone says this ought to be a law. So you advocate, you introduce the, the bill, you send it to committee, you mark it up, it goes to the floor, it makes it through the Senate, they have a conference committee to get something to happen. It gets a final vote, and then finally the governor signs it into law. And at every, and then uh, as it's signed into law, every single step of the way, you can advocate. Whether it's talking to the committee members, whether it's sending word to everybody in the House, whether it's meeting with key people in the Senate, whether it's sending something to the governor's office, which we haven't done nearly as much uh, in the past, and sometimes our wins turned into losses right at the end as he vetoed it. Um, so. All in all, we have to be thinking about playing advocacy at all stages in the game. And the closer things get towards the end of session, there are certain bills that are going to die. They're, they're not going to make it through. So we really want to turn our efforts to make sure that we are forcing everything that can make its way through, run with it to the goal line. Um, and things that aren't going to fly, we don't need to put in that much attention to them this session and hope that uh, the political climate is different in the next session. Okay, how do you uh, connect with your officials? First, if it's, you're meeting them for the first time, introduce yourself. Who you represent, uh, particularly you can say you're representing Doctors for Change and yourself, but if you work for an institution, let's say in the Texas Medical Center, you can say I work at such a facility, but you may want to be explicit saying you're not representing said facility, um, uh, unless you have permission 
from the school. Uh, for example, I work at Baylor College of Medicine in the Texas Children's Hospital. I would, if somebody asks, I could say what my day job is, but I wouldn't rep say that I'm representing them. And then I, again, always share whether you or a family member or somebody uh, key to them is a constituent. You really want to focus on a main issue. Oftentimes we'll have primers that have two or three different issues and we can gloss over things, particularly if there's time and they ask us to be involved. Um, you always have to be sure you state your position, pro or against um, certain bills and what they're, they're main, uh, meant to accomplish. What are we concerned about? What you're going, to, what you're doing about it, and what they can do about it, either supporting or being against certain bills. Ask about any questions and what his position or, or her position is if they have it. But don't be surprised if you meet a staff member. So a lot of times I make a parallel or an analogy to the ward team. On the internal medicine wards, we have the attending who's the big boss who has to sign off on charts. The person who really knows what's going on with the team and, and regulating uh, the inflow outflow of patients is the upper level and oftentimes there's an intern and a co-intern on the team somebody who's going to take care of the patient every single day and somebody that takes care of him on that day off and knows about them peripherally but isn't always involved and then you have medical students who are there to learn as well in an office you have the decision maker so the office holder there's a chief of staff who really runs the office and 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 what the agenda is is it's the right hand person there, uh, the, the, person, the intern is gonna be our health policy person. That's who we want. But there could be somebody in education or transportation. And if the health policy person's on the floor, there's gonna be another uh, um, uh, policy uh, uh, legislative aide who is going to be around. And then you have the interns or the receptionists who will oftentimes ask if you want water, they'll take messages, they may jot notes. But oftentimes when you're meeting with them, they aren't the ones who are going to have much uh, uh, to say. They may listen. They're, they're there to learn oftentimes. Some of them may be college students want to get involved in politics or healthcare, care um, and doing that for, for a summer. There are five different, uh, now that you know the different types of people you can meet, there are usually classified five different types of responses. The first one may be a don't call us, we'll call you. We're too busy to hear this. Um, just leave your information. Tell us what you want to do, and uh, we'll be back in touch with you. Don't be surprised if those uh, meetings are very short. If you meet with one of those interns, you might get the, I'm new, I don't know anything about this uh, issue. Uh, please educate me more. Uh, they're gonna jot notes, but don't expect them to, to come up with a position of what the office uh, means to say. You may be meeting an office that agrees with you. You're preaching to the choir. Yes, that's, that's what they've been fighting for. So how, why would you educate them? Really what you wanna do is you wanna find out what are the things that are, are roadblocks that, that are gonna uh, prevent the, the bill from going? Who should you be meeting with next? thank them for what they're doing, but figure out how we can help as well. Then you might get a, uh, that's not my position, or they disagree, and so you're there to help educate, but you may want to try to find out why they disagree. Maybe it's all politics. Maybe they agree about the science, but they don't agree about the politics. Um, so uh, we, we really want to find what that common ground is. And then rarely I've heard about uh, uh, experiences where they disagree with everything you say and then people end up leaving crying because uh, you might not be one of their constituents and it really doesn't happen often. I've heard about it one time, I think, in, in 10 years of, of going to, their, to these offices. So legislative advocacy days, we tended to do it Wednesdays, but really now there's a lot more opportunity as we can do it virtually from other days. Uh, Tuesdays ended up being our days of going and giving testimony and Wednesdays was when uh, many of the committees were meeting and so, uh, Oftentimes uh, we would go and they'd be in committee, so we'd meet with staffers. I think this opens up more opportunity uh, to, to do things virtually. So you can get involved at any level. You're really there to build relationships with your, with your elected official, reflect on your experiences, brainstorm ideas, sharing those. All right, I see, I see that Dr. Lamb went offline real quick. So let's uh, give it a few minutes to see if he's able to join in. In the interim, just a couple of things um, to announce that I put in the chat if you didn't see it. We, we do collect stories to help with our own advocacy and storytelling, and there was a link to that. So if you have a patient story, obviously with permission um, to share or an experience that you have personally, please go ahead and go, you know, share those stories with us so that we can use these in our advocacy writing, calling, emailing your legislators, using social media, and then providing feedback to the, uh, uh, um, to the lawmaker as well. For people who are involved in public health, there are uh, online blogs that people can be involved with as well. This is an example of Dr. Dark, who's one of the emergency room physicians. So uh, ways that we can get involved, voting, keeping up to date with issues, Twitter, op-eds, communications, getting involved, uh, writing legislation, 
And so these are some some homework that we can do right now, getting involved with uh, DFC, American College of Physicians is another one of the groups that I participate in and uh, ways to get in touch with me through email. Thank you.